Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining me. I wasn't expecting a full room. That's awesome. At Independa, the largest online financial website in the Netherlands, we relate to the Continuous Integration and Deployment Party. We had an old release flow, and it worked. It gave us a little bit of flexibility, and we even had two releases a week. We were quite happy. But it was also cumbersome. There was a lot of manual steps that we had to do in order to get our site to production. Some of the automation that we'd done was simply taking those manual steps, putting them in a pow um, PowerShell script, and making sure that we ran that manually at the right time. That made it really fault intolerant. We could break it quite easily without meaning to. And on top of that, the developers had no idea how any of this worked. It was only the webmaster that could do it. Basically, it was out of date. It was time to move on. As developers, we wanted to work in a more modern way. We wanted to get fast feedback on what we were building, and we wanted to know that we were building the right things in the right way. We spent a lot of time, effort, sweat, tears at time, and of course, money, on making sure that we could move our release flow forward. So we're doing CICD now. No. Like a lot of companies, we're still right at the start of our journey. We've got a lot of people struggling for change within the organization. After all, it's difficult to change people even when there's really strong reasons to do so. Smoking can kill you, people still smoke. Drinking can be dangerous, people still drink. A motorbike is probably one of the most dangerous normal forms of transport, and I love riding my bike, much to my mum's frustration. Things take longer than we'd like to get started. Sometimes the pace can seem glacial. While you're ready to start running along, other people are still learning to walk. And yet others are in the background digging their heels and actively trying to slow you down. I'd like to take you on my journey of frustrations and errors and what I've learned along the way. I don't have any solutions, I'm afraid. There's no magic solution to this because there's no one solution to offer. After all, within one company, within one department, and even within one small team, you've got different personalities, which gives you different problems, and so you need different solutions to solve them. But I'd like to take a look at my mistakes and then go away and make your own. Hi. I'm Stacey Cashmore. I've been a developer since the mid-1990s, and over that time, I've worked in various different types of companies, from the absolute chaotic, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, to the absolute micromanaged, almost telling you what to put in your line of code. I've worked at Independent now for 13 years, and I'm pleased to say I get a lot of freedom there to allow me to change the way I work to make my life better and hopefully make other people's lives better. I even managed to uh, introduce one of the first release flows, the one I spoke about, in the company. Now I get to kill it. I get to replace it with something that's more agile, more fault tolerant, and allows us to deliver the value we want in a more fluid manner. But before I talk about that, I do want to say something about tooling, because of course you need it. You can't do this without it. The changes that we made to our site included obvious things like uh, moving to Git so we could have an easier branching strategy, making pull requests so we had a good idea what was being sent to production, and then gating those pull requests just to make sure that people actually looked at them and we knew what changes were going into the database, etc. And a lot more besides that. And with current technology, that's not that hard to do. It takes a lot of time and it become, can be complex, but it's perfectly doable. You can have a complete system set up, one that tracks your changes, builds everything, deploys it, even have feature toggles so you can practice faster to master. And you can get lots of insights and feedback on each step of the process. But none of that matters if people don't use it. When this happens, for whatever reason, the system's just used as little as possible. And a perfect system that's only used once a month for a 1,000 file merge isn't a system. So whilst the tooling 
is really important. The people are just as, maybe more important to take care of. And when you're the person that spent two years trying to change the release flow when people are fighting you, that can be really frustrating. You can get so frustrated and at times even angry at the people dragging their heels and not coming along with you. And that can really make you think some bad things about your colleagues at times. Maybe you start to think the worst of people that they just don't care about improving. They prefer engineering apathy over excellence. Or maybe they just think that it's too difficult to learn anything new. I know what I'm doing. I've been doing it for years. Thank you very much. I'll pass. Or maybe you can just really think, God, you're lazy. Why don't you just do this? And that's really not fair. But I'm human, so I still do it, even now, more than I should. What you have to remember is that these other people are also people like you. You have your frustrations, they have their fears and preconceptions too. They might fear the impact that it's going to bring to their day-to-day -day work. They might fear unwanted side effects on quality of introducing changes that they might not believe are the right way forward. They might have preconceptions about what the new process is going to force them to do. It might block checks to enforce quality. The faster to master might even force them to put unfinished, untested changes to production, and this is just bad. I'm going to share three short stories of situations I've been in, how I've dealt with them, what I've learned, and how other people have coped too. My first story, learning from mistakes, otherwise known as crap, something went wrong. Or even better, how I just kept on making mistakes until I found something that worked. We had a problem on the mortgage section of our website. We were losing requests going to the back office. There were validations firing off, so these things were marked as suspicious and not coming through. We found them, we handled them, we didn't lose anything, I'm pleased to say, but it added a whole load of manual work to our back office, and they're also trying to improve their flow, and we're just handing them extra work. And on top of that, copying out a um, JSON file and entering it manually into a system is really fault intolerant. We found the problem, we fixed it quickly, we've got production working, everything's fine. But then we're left with the question of how did this happen? And that one was tough for us, because in the past we've tried to use postmortems, but people always skip through it really quickly and you always end up with the same results. We just need to test more. But I thought, well, I'm going to do this one by myself. I'm just going to do a little experiment, sit down and try and work through it in my head and see what I can come up with. Why did nobody notice this? Why with the myriad of manual checks that we have in place did this manage to slip through the packs and get into production? And looking at it, I found this was a complicated case. It was no happy flow. On our site, we have a number of norms that we use to help people not to have to know every single thing. And in all of these cases, they were overridden in ways that we weren't really expecting. It also required multiple systems. The validations checked on the website, but we found the problem in our backend CRM system. And the developers didn't test these unhappy flows, and they didn't test the back office systems. And the testers didn't test all of these unhappy flows. They did test the back system. We still missed it. And our product owners did the same as the developers. Repeatedly, we did this during development, during testing, drawing release, and it took us a day or so to spot these things in production. So we've got an answer to what we need to do. More and better testing. If developers test everything from A to Z for every change, if the testers test everything from A to Z for every change, and if the product owners test everything from A to Z for every change, we won't have this problem in production ever again. But that's just too easy. That's exactly the same as we come up with in every other postmortem that we do. And it's not going to work because there's people involved and people forget things. We miss steps. 
we don't have 48 hours a day to do all of these manual tests. It's just not going to work. How, by itself as a question, isn't doing it for us? You can spend hours blame gaming with this. It's fantastic for blame games. You can go backwards and forwards. Well, you didn't test this. Well, you didn't test this. Yeah, but you didn't test that. Yeah, but you didn't test it first. It doesn't help, though. You just argue with your colleagues. So maybe I'm asking the wrong question. So how do we stop it happening again? Can we dig a little bit deeper and try and find something better to work with? Well, we need to reduce the manual testing. We don't have those 48 hours. We need to make the test cases more realistic. A simple smoke test running through the site and say, yep, everything works, no crashes, isn't going to cut it anymore. And we need to know when something's wrong. It needs to be atomic. If the website validations are failing, then the website needs to tell us that the validations are failing. That gave me more concrete goals than the first run through of, we need to do more manual testing. So uh, yeah, much better than just saying test and going and having a game of pool to celebrate. So we thought, you know, we need unit testing. This bug was actually really easy to find with unit testing, which historically we've not done. We're changing that now. We need to get the feedback from the site working. And we need to add some end-to-end -end testing, more than we should do because we have those unit tests lacking. That'll give us an early warning for mistakes. Before it leaves the developer's machine, we can know that something's broken and fix it on time. And as a developer, I thought, well, we want to do more unit tests, so I'll start with a unit test. We'll pick those up. And then it was, but this is legacy code. And it's really not unit testable, again, for those same historic reasons. And so we needed a large amount of data for a unit test. You could only test entire API calls almost at once. So for every test, you need a whole complex request. It was unmanageable. So I did some refactoring. And we even did some rewriting, because we really needed to open it up. And then we found a bug. And that was really cool, because everybody clapped ourselves on the back and said, hey, this isn't just a waste of time that sounds good. We found a bug before the users found a bug. This is awesome. So we fixed it. We celebrated, we put it to production, and then, oops. In fixing that bug, we introduced a bug. And that bug went through the whole process. And it went into production. And we had a hot fix. And you got that horrible sinking feeling where you're desperately trying to help the back office. And actually, all we've done is given them yet more work on top of that. So. Postmortem, the postmortem. What did I do wrong? Of all the issues that we had, the original one's still there. This bug got through the process and went to production. Only now we had good unit tests. They were correct. They passed. That wasn't a problem. But production still broke. So what caused it? Well, it turns out one of those bugs was handled elsewhere. The code that called the validations knew there was a bug in the validations. And it passed a kind of tweaked message just to make sure that that validation still passed. In fixing the validation, I broke the call now because it's sending a wrong request. And we failed to catch it. Even with all of the manual testing, because we're still at the start of getting our testing automated, this spent a week with our tester going through it, everybody was happy. Nope, it still managed to make its way to production. So I thought, maybe the order <clears throat> that I'm picking these up in is wrong. We'd failed to realize what was going to be the biggest impact in quality with the changes that we were doing. Yes, in a Greenfield site, we should have started with unit tests. But we're dealing with old legacy code that we know doesn't have coverage. So maybe, first of all, we should make sure that we know when something's going to go wrong. After that, let's have lots of automatic tests so that if we change something that isn't yet tested, we know we've not broken it in doing those tests, 
and then we can add the unit test. They still need to be there. We just need to make sure we don't break anything in the process. So we did that. We made sure that all of the flow could be tested successfully. And then we move forward. And now we have, for this particular point, it's always tested every time without fail and without thinking, did I catch that weird edge case? And again, all before it leaves the developer's machine. That side worked. We still have problems on production. There's still weird edge cases that we didn't think about, and there's still even weirder users that we have no idea what they think they're doing, but it's valid entry in theory, it should work. But now, when we find them, we make the tests, end-to-end -end unit tests, and then we move on. Three things kind of came at me from going through this process. The first is concentrate on the now. In that first pass, even though it was in the wrong order, if I'd have just concentrated on getting the refactoring done and getting the code suitable for unit tests, I wouldn't have introduced this problem. I wouldn't have put a bug in the middle of all of this refactoring without knowing how to test it. Which also led me on to keeping my pull requests clean. In doing the refactoring, we introduced lots of essentially new files in new folders. And in the middle of all of this, we changed two lines of code to fix a bug. No one was ever going to spot it. If I'd have done the refactoring and then gone back and changed these two lines of code, who knows, maybe someone would have gone, um, are you sure that's not relied on somewhere else before you start changing it? And we could have looked further. And finally, focus on the immediate bottlenecks. In the DevOps handbook and the Phoenix project, they talk about handling things in the right order. Focus on the immediate value and the immediate risk. Don't start fixing false bottlenecks before you've handled the real ones. The second time round, the real bottleneck was it wasn't visible on the site. Having coped with that one, then you can reevaluate and pick up the next most important bottleneck. My second story revolves around one of my colleagues and just showing how easy it is to fall back into old patterns even when you're trying to do something um, new and differently. In mid-2018, there was a decision taken at the department level that we were going to experiment with faster to master. Until that time, we'd had way too long living branches. Merges were a nightmare. Things went wrong when you're ready to go to production, and we wanted to change that. I caused a lot of fear within the department. You can't go back to the master in anything less than a few weeks. It's dangerous. And that group of people included me initially. I didn't see how it was possible to ensure that this was still safe. But I kind of missed the point. Moving to faster to master, that's not going to solve any of our problems. It's the changes that you have to do to make this work. That's what's going to help you and what's going to move you forward. And that click was a mindset change for me. Instead of being afraid, I suddenly got really excited. It's such a challenge to try and change from one extreme to another and do this safely. It was awesome. Within my team, there were different views. There were a few people who were in the middle. Well, you know, we can try this. I'm not sure it's going to work, but we can try it. And there was one guy that was absolutely, no, this isn't going to work. I'm not doing this. This is dangerous. For him, long-lived branches meant quality. Short-lived branches meant losing all of that quality. And that made for some really interesting retrospectives. We went backwards and forwards, sprint after sprint, and eventually, I don't know why, we actually started to have good dis discussions about it. About why he was so certain it was a bad thing. Why he was so insistent that no other company in the world would dream of doing faster to master. Why it was reckless to the point of irresponsibility or even negligence for what we're putting through to production. And then he started to state his points. 
it's not possible to test anything, no matter how small, in our current setup, if it's not on a long living branch. For him, we had to wait before starting. Turns out he wasn't against it in principle, he was against it with our code base. If we had full coverage, full unit tests, full end-to-end -end tests, full integration tests, then he was happy. Once we had perfection, we could start. I didn't want perfection. I wanted to be a little bit more pragmatic. The last time I counted, which was five years ago or so, we had a quarter of a million lines of legacy code. Some of this is more than a decade old, and it's been through some interesting architects in that time. We can't wait for perfection because perfection's never going to arrive. But maybe we could start experimenting with small, contained, simple changes. Even I had to admit that there were parts of our code that, yeah, we really needed some proper tests because it was nasty. But we could be pragmatic. Let's start. Let's move forward. And there's no time like the present. We'd already started adding unit tests, adding end-to-end -end tests. But it was currently on a best effort basis. If you had time, you did it. If you didn't have time, you didn't do it. And that's not good enough. Because whilst we're adding more and more tests, and in lines, more and more coverage, in percentage of the site, it's actually going down. We're making more changes than we're adding tests to. We're making things worse. And that's just causing stress for everybody. So as a team, we decided all changes are going to be automatically tested. Full stop. No more best um, effort. This is how we work now. We're going to make sure everything is covered. This terrified our tester. And possibly with good reason, because historically, all of this would have been on him. Previously, uh, our end-to-end -end testing system wasn't available to developers. We couldn't run it, we couldn't write it, and we couldn't check the results. It was, hey, tester, enjoy. And that's just not feasible here. But we've recently moved to Cypress, and that's JavaScript. It's code, and we're coders. So we could do this. The tester could validate our thoughts and could validate our tests, but he didn't actually have to write them himself. With the added advantage of he wasn't a coder, so some of his tests were interesting anyway. We discussed this. We agreed on it. We went to lunch and decided this afternoon, sprint planning, this is where we start. And then it kind of went wrong again. The upcoming sprint was full of large changes that were well-defined. We knew what was going to happen. The biggest question is, what can we fit in the sprint? Only there's a couple of housekeeping stories. There's a couple of mortgage providers that have changed things. And if we don't change the site to match, then we can no longer have them available. There's changes in legalities. And so you have to do things quickly, otherwise the uh, financial ombudsman gets really upset at you. They're important. They weren't yet urgent. The major changes still had priority. And our product owner simply asked, is it possible to fit this in? And a colleague of mine gave a wonderful um, answer. I've heard it many times before. No doubt I will again. Hey, if we just forget what we discussed this morning, then we can just slip it in and just quickly do it. Later, when we have time, We'll add the tests for it. I was shocked, less than impressed. May have swore just a little bit. It was two hours. That's the amount of time between deciding to do this and deciding to drop it. The very first sprint planning. To drop the change that we were doing to make our changes more reliable to allow us to deliver more fluidly to production. And here we were saying, OK, we'll, we'll just stop straight away. And it wasn't through laziness. And it wasn't because of difficulty. He wanted to help the business. He was doing this because he thought it was a good thing. I can get this change that you need in production next week, no problem. But what about all of the other changes? We've got a Spring backlog full of quite complex things. 
And our tester is now going to be busy manually testing this small thing, which means he can't validate our tests, which means our tests aren't going to be good enough, which is just going to add to the backlog, which is going to slow us down and make things worse. Now, eventually, this wouldn't have been good. And that's safe. That's just two hours after deciding to do this. It's still fresh in our heads why we're doing this. Now imagine weeks, months down the line when this comes up and it's not fresh in your head why we're doing this. And you can really see why this kind of thing is hard to do. But again, it was from a good place. It was totally the wrong thing, but it was for the right reason. I was speaking to him a few weeks later, um, asking him, well, first of all, can I include this story in my talk or is this going to really upset you if I do? Thankfully, he said yes. But we got talking about where his mindset comes from. And it turns out where he grew up and started working, getting stuff into production is the top thing. For the business, there is one priority, that code in production. There's no time for techies to do anything techie that they want to do. That's just pointless. Yes, you want perfection, fine. Just get it in production. We want money from this. I'm moving from that mindset to saying, look, yeah, I can make this change, but it's really not safe, so I'm not going to. To him, he was deliberately holding back from the business. He was holding back value. He was getting in the way of actually earning money. And yeah, it's tough. But those gains are only ever short-lived. I can be fast today. I can be quick tomorrow. A few weeks, I might be OK. But at some point, I'm going to move to a crawl. You're going to get the inevitable death march trying to get a project out because you're fighting all of this code that you're generating. It's not sustainable. And the biggest loser here is the business and your own head when you're trying to fight the code. What helped him was our product owner. She was awesome. She is awesome. As soon as I swore, she said, nope, that's not what we discussed. We're not doing that. We said, we're only going to do stuff if we have the tests. That's what we agreed. That's what we're doing. It can wait. She accepted that in order to move to our new way of working, we were going to slow down. All of this was fairly new for all of us. Like I say, it's, we have some interesting past that we have to get past to move on. We're learning on the job. We have a quarter of a million lines of code which aren't covered. So every time we make a change, we've got to figure out what we need to cover to have these automatic tests. And she accepted learning on the job for us. And that's something that I know a lot of employees in my past haven't accepted. And I know that that's something quite a lot of developers can struggle with because you should be providing value to the business today. And you're not doing that if you're learning in their heads. Hopefully, as we get better coverage, we're going to get back to our old pace. We're going to pick up. We're going to know what we're doing. We can move forward. Only then we'll have the knowledge that things are covered, that we've not broken anything, that we can make changes with a high degree of certainty and quality. And if we can do that without spending weeks manually testing every small change, then maybe we could move even quicker in the future. And actually, we got feedback on that quicker than we were expecting. At the heart of our mortgage software, we have a really complex calculation to figure out what's the maximum mortgage that you can have. And it's horrible every time we have to make a change to it. It's complicated in what it does. It's complicated in how it does it. And it's complicated in all of the systems that it talks to, to do it. Every time we make a change, it's literally a week's worth of testing. Does this look right? Does this look right? Does this look right? Does this look right? Is that number making sense to you? So it's a nightmare. We hate doing it. And then we had a story. We need to make a change. And the guy that was totally dead set against this whole process looked at us and went, does this mean changing the algorithm? And we kind of sheepishly went, yeah. Yeah, OK, 
long as the automatic test flow, that's fine. We can go to production. I nearly fainted. I can't state how amazing that made me feel. In doing a little bit longer per change in the preceding sprints, we'd saved a week's worth of testing. And we knew that what we tested was better than it would have been with the manual testing. It was awesome. I'm not going to say that everything is as it should be now. We're still learning. We're still moving forward. But I can say with some confidence, we're better than we were. And we no longer fear learning on the job to try out something new to improve life in the future. My last story is about dealing with a wider group than just our own little team. About how interacting with that wider group outside of the development department even can provide some interesting results. In order to get our release pipeline updated, we formed a CI mini group. I'd call it a guild, but it's not quite that official. And we've been working on how can we get changes to the database to production better? How can we get zero downtime deployments, uh, not only for production, which we already had, but also our test environments so that we can update it faster without everybody going, hey, who's deploying? And about how we can make test environments on the fly as we need them, should we need them, and many other things aside. It's a huge list, and it's also on a best effort basis. We all have our own teams we're working in, and sometimes it just goes too slow. Sometimes you kind of get the feeling that we're also waiting for perfection before we move forward. Unless it's perfect, we can't try something new. And that kind of makes you feel sometimes that you've lost sight of the forest for the trees. We're not trying to make an awesome database deployment. That's not the plan here. That's something we need for our plan. What can we do? So we started a smaller, even more informal group. Uh, three of us had decided we want to get a daily build and release made and get that to production. So we can go once a day to production. We can't do this 100%. There's some changes which our infrastructure won't cope with that our DBA doesn't know how he wants to cope with this yet. But we can capture most, and we can give a nice get out for the ones that we can't cover. And maybe if we do this, we're going to save the business time as well, because they're not testing three days worth of changes. They're now only testing changes on the days when they have it in smaller blocks. We spent an afternoon working out the kinks in our current flow. How could we do this? Turns out there wasn't that much. And then we spent another afternoon putting together a presentation to give to the wider business, because making this change without them would have been really interesting. But this is a response we got. And even worse, this is before we even showed them the PowerPoint or gave our thoughts. They caught wind of what we were working on, and it just came back from the business. We are not doing this. Once a day is too much. The business will not test daily. We're not doing this. Stop now. You're wasting your time. One of the guys I was working with sent out a really short email. He's Dutch, but he could be English. That's really disappointing. I didn't. I was less than impressed. I was fuming. The effort we'd put in, and before we could even do anything, it's been stopped for no reason. And I started to write my thoughts out and send an email to the people that were working on the CI group. And as soon as you start doing this, you figure out fairly quickly this is not a productive email. This is venting. This is getting rid of your frustration. So I double-checked who I was sending it to. And I put rant tags top and bottom. And I even tried to put reasonable aims and goals underneath, thinking that that could maybe mitigate it a bit. My manager did not agree with that sentiment. But it worked. Other people in the group opened this. And they were reading the email going, yep, 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 yep. I spent an afternoon having lots of conversations, lots of coffee, working things through, 
because sitting and complaining feels great. <laughs> After all, we're human, it works. What it doesn't do is move you forward. But you can try and work the frustration out of your system. And then with that stress gone, you can take a step back. And you think, how do we move forward from here? How do we not just let this be the end? We had conversations with the business. We tried to find out what their bottlenecks were. Why are they so against this? And it turns out the business wasn't actually against daily releases per se. They had two issues. There was too much testing of the same thing. In order to move code to production, you had to test on project, test on test, test on you at, make sure it works in production. And doing that on a daily basis, they weren't interested in. And the other one was, if we have a release and not everybody has approved their changes, we don't go to production. And with part-time workers, people were worried that they were going to hold the entire company up just for them. It's cool. How can we work with this? This is really useful information. We now have an idea what the problems are. We've got something tangible that we can get our teeth into and move forward. And at this point, the disappointment is gone. I'm full in excitement mode again. I've got something I can work with. I can move forward. How can we change the current process? How can we reduce the burden on the product owners in their daily life? And how can we, can, how can we get rid of them from the release flow altogether? So I did some thought experiments. Find bottlenecks, see if we can remove them. And the first one was a nice, simple one. How about we just share the knowledge? If you know you're not going to be available the next day to test a release, just speak to one of your colleagues and say, hey, look, I've got this thing. Here's what you need to test. Can you approve it for me, please? If you do this, you know that you're always going to be able to go to production. We've cleared the issue of not being able to move a release to production for one person. Only as developers, we already do this. We've been doing this for a while, and it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because we're people, and we forget. We don't do things. It's really not as easy as it sounds. And on top of that, the product owners and the business have complained about the time they spend doing this. And my first thought experiment is, hey, you've got no time, but can you just do this as well, please? No, it wasn't going to work. So second thought experiment. The release is still a bottleneck. Well, how about we just don't complete the pull request? As a team, you know if the people are available. So you know, is it safe to click this button? And as you know, all problems are solved by not merging back to master. When that person comes back, they're going to have to go back to their old work. The entire team is going to have to context switch to that old work. And you're going to have to do another merge to master and hope to God somebody's not broken your changes while you've been gone. Fairly quickly, no. Obviously, that's also not going to work. My third thought experiment, I got lucky. I decided that the only way we could do this is to actually remove the work completely. Stop trying to focus on the symptoms and start trying to focus on the actual causes of the problems. Anytime we touch a symptom, we introduce a side effect. It's not good. It never works as we want it to. How can we change our process to get rid of this? And you know what? I can't do this for an entire department because we need to do some A-B testing here to make sure what works. Getting 35 people suddenly onto something new, it's too much effort. I can do it with one team. So I decided to do it with my team. And I started to sketch out some proof of concepts, just some A4 pieces of paper trying to draw a flow down and get something that works. How can we support our move to deliver stuff more fluidly? I took these preliminary, sc preliminary sketches and a big flipboard piece of paper and pencils and a load of Sharpies and came up with something that we could try as a team, something suitable for a small team that we could organize. 
By using more automated testing, we could make sure that the tester or the product owner only had to validate her ideas and that we just had to um, prove to her that this was going to work after a merge. And this helps the product owner because now they're not testing acceptance criteria anymore. They're not saying, yeah, this is on the page. They're actually working through and validating their ideas in their heads. They're not commenting on our code. They're saying, does my idea work? So the product owner's not going to test anything after they say yes. And that provides a lot more value to the company than just simply saying, hey, yeah, the developer put that button on the screen. And now we know that all these thoughts are correct, and we know that the code is automatically tested, the product owner can approve a pull request with us because we still need something for the auditors to prove that we're not just pushing random stuff to production. Our auditors are really hot on this. But that's far better than just a release flow that's there purely for paperwork purposes. And it has an awesome side effect. Product owner knows it's going to work, which means the developer knows it's going to work, which means the tester knows it's going to work, which means nobody has to test in the release flow anymore. The developer can concentrate on what they're doing. They don't have to context switch. The tester can spend some time doing exploratory testing just to make sure that there's nothing unfound in the website. And within 20 minutes of deploying to our test site, we know whether or not we can move forward to production. Result. At least, that's the hypothesis. This one's still in progress. We're still tweaking. We have to find out what real life throws at us to back up the ideas. In letting go of the frustration at the beginning, I could start this experiment. Imagine if I hadn't, and I just spent weeks moping and furious and burning. and It wouldn't be healthy. It would get in the way of me doing my work. It would get in the way of me offering new ideas, because what's the point? If I offer something new, it's just going to be, nope. So let it go. How you do that is personal. Everybody's different, but do it professionally. Do it quick. Do it to the right people. And don't do it constantly. Otherwise, no one's ever going to take you seriously. I don't know if that email was the right thing to do in this situation, but I, I'm really happy with the result that I got out of it. Taking that raw energy and pouring it into solving a problem instead of taking that raw energy and pouring it into a glass at the end of the day. So over the course of these three stories, what have I learned for myself? Well, one is the first case study, I was the pragmatist. I was dealing with myself. At that time in my life, that was the best way forward for me. I was in control. That's not saying that it was easy. It wasn't. But at least I was in control, so I wasn't trying to convince other people. I could move on with it with myself. So if you're going to start with an experiment, you don't know where to start, you don't know who to start with, maybe that's a good place. And when you're figuring out what to start with, then have a look at yourself. What causes you the most pain? That's always a nice place to start. If you can try something that makes your life better, awesome. If you can see something you can change that makes somebody else's life better, even better. As long as you're experimenting, you're moving. And when it fails, don't get caught up in the fact that it fails. It's a learning experience. Keep on going back and repeating it until it works. A colleague of mine loves to quote Grace Hopper. It's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. And yeah, you might break production as I did, but most things you can fix. And when it works, I've never yet had anybody complain that I made their lives better. So take it, don't get disheartened, repeat your experiments, tweak it, move forward, learn, and try again. And as you go along, you're going to find that you're going to need to work with other people, as I did when I was changing the um, release structure of the site. Brainstorm together. Find like-minded people that are burning as brightly as you are. And then spread it further. 
communicate with people at the coffee machine, over lunch, when you're both staring at the screen thinking, oh God, I need a break. Just make sure you talk. And if you're feeling up to it, share with a wider group of people. I started to do this in our department catch-up meetings, a five, 10 minute lightning talk just to try and pass something on that you'd learned. Who knows, maybe you can spark somebody quickly that way. And if that works, maybe something bigger. Do you have like-minded colleagues? Can you do an internal meetup, a pizza night, and go in depth in what you're doing instead of five minutes? Try and let people know what you're learning. And when you're doing it, let your enthusiasm show. Allow others to see that you've got this thing which you are so psyched about. It puts a knot in your stomach. You want to move forward with this. Let them know the joy of success, the questions that come with a failure and just the pure frustration when nothing goes right at all. It's all part of the process. It works with you. And remember, not everyone's going to be the same. You're going to get resistance. That guy in my team was trying to help me. He wasn't just being a git blocking everything I did. He had thoughts and ideas which needed to be taken seriously. So listen to these people. Don't just watch the mouth going whilst thinking about the symptoms in your head. Listen to their fears and frustrations. They may see roadblocks you don't. Some of them are going to be right. Some of them are going to be wrong. But I can say I learned more from him blocking me at every step of the way than I did at my colleagues that went with me. And remember, not everybody has the same passion as you, and that's fine too. Some people just want to go home at the end of the day. Don't let it discourage you. Don't let it frustrate you. That's much easier said than done. Just move forward. That's me. Thank you for taking the time to go through this. I hope you can look at some of my mistakes. I hope you can go make your own mistakes. I hope you can share those and let others start making their mistakes too. If you've got any questions or comments, I'm here and outside. Uh, or you can contact me on Twitter at Stacy underscore Cash. I've been Stacy Cashmore. Thank you for your time and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.